What's up YouTube? I'm Mike and today I'm, got, I'm going to attempt to shoot a video about really a very controversial topic, especially for a white man to be talking about. I don't think we're like allowed to talk about shit like this and um, which means basically that I'm going to talk about it because I like to do everything that I'm not allowed to do because uh, fuck the rules and because I think it's a topic that needs to be said. I'm sure it's been said millions of times. Hopefully, what I'm about to say is not the first time you've heard this. Um, what I'm talking about today is the fact that uh, racism and slavery are alive and well in America today. That seems to be, that, that may shock some of you. I, I'm sure most of you, especially if you're a, a, a member of a minority race, if you're a person of color, you're probably like, well, yeah, white boy. No shit racism, ex racism exists. What you might be surprised to find out though, and are likely going to be going to want to argue this point quite vigorously, is that uh, slavery too is alive in America. And a lot of you black folks out there, y'all voted for it. Yeah, that that's the part where we're probably gonna not be friends. So. As I go through my, my little presentation today, I want you to be aware of something called cognitive bias. Cognitive bias, and more importantly, cognitive dissonance, is when is when you have when you have believed something so long that it becomes a core of who you are. Like, for example, your religion. Religion is generally the thing that causes the most cognitive bias, uh, cognitive dissonance in the world. If you're a Christian and somebody comes along and, and they show you some really good evidence that, you know, the earth's not 6,000 years old and that evolution is real, um, even though you may, may want to believe the evidence that you're viewing, it, it, it makes you extremely uncomfortable because you're not really willing to let go of all of the years that you spent believing the lie. This is called cognitive dissonance, and this is what caused people to shut down. They start hearing something that they don't want to hear and rather than listen to the point that's being made and view it on the merits, on its own merits itself, they just shut down and stop listening. So I hope that those of you in my audience will, will, will give my message its day in court because it could be the thing that actually sets you free in this world. So the one thing I think all of us, uh, mo mo well, again, myself and people of color, I think, can agree with in large part is that uh, the United States was founded by some very, very racist men, extremely racist men. They, they were racist and they were sexist. And, and you can see that this is true by looking at the documentation that they used to found this nation. So we had to write amendments into the Constitution that gave um, African American people the right to vote. We had to get, we had to change the founding documents to allow women to vote. So the patriarchy and, and really the white patriarchy was alive and well in the founding of this country. And then you fast forward a little bit and uh, down here in the deep south you had, uh, you had racism. I mean, excuse me, you had slavery. And so we, there's no point in debating on who, where the, how the slaves got here, who's ultimately responsible for that. There's a lot of bullshit going on in our society, the nitpicking these details. What we can all agree upon is that in the South, at a minimum, in the United States, there were a myriad of plantations and other slave-type run businesses where, by and large, black people were, were, were purchased captured, purchased, sold, traded, and they were um, enslaved on these, on these, let's say, plantations. So in this environment, you would have a big plantation house, and then you would have slave quarters, and then you would have the fields. And so the majority of the slaves lived in the slave quarters, and some of the slaves lived in the big house, and, and because they worked in the big house, their duties were there. Um, this, is, this is kind of illustrated to some degree in one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, Django Unchained. Uh, holy shit, I've watched this movie just trillions of fucking times. And so, um, in this environment, you had slave quarters, some people living in what they called the big house, 
But by and large, these people were not free to leave. They were treated very, very horrifically. And uh, they, were, they were indentured uh, slaves. So they were provided the, the, the mere basics in life. So they were provided some amount of room and board, generally, like I said, in the slave quarters or somewhere in the big house. And then they were actually provided a wage in the form of uh, they were fed and clothed and sheltered. So in, 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 in return for their labors, they were given room and board and food and shelter. And I'm sure the, the, the quality of these conditions varied from plantation to plantation. How much food somebody was given, I'm sure, was varied. But, but, but being that I have been a slave, basically being that I have been locked up personally inside of a prison camp and been forced to work for uh, 35 cents a day, or th excuse me, 35 cents an hour, um, I know that they actually feed you pretty well. So I don't think that, by and large, Slaves who were working grueling hours in the field were starving because you don't get you don't get good you don't get good la you don't get good labor out of people who are starving to fucking death. So even when I was enslaved, I was fed plenty of calories so that they could whip my ass into cutting as many trees as they wanted me to cut in a given day or planting as many trees as they wanted me to plant in a given day. So that is the conditions that existed in the pre-Civil War. And um, that's when you get this next big issue um, that uh, is the history of slavery in America. And that is that black men, um, uh, I guess because I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember if women were even voting at the time, black people were considered two-thirds of a man. They did, the, the North didn't want all the black slaves voting. Because that gave the South too much power, which is one of the big reasons, the actual reasons for the Civil War. A lot of people think that the North was just, just were just a bunch of like, you know, uh, humanists who just felt so horribly bad for the, the slaves. This is patently false. They honestly didn't give two fucks about slaves. They just cared about power. And the, the, the South had too much power because they've got all of these people who can vote. And and they also have free labor in their plantations. They're not. They weren't undergoing the industrial revolution in the South, and there was no reason to build expensive machines when you've got a bunch of, um, you know, you've got a bunch of slaves who you can whip around in the fields and make them do do grueling amounts of work. So, uh, so it was decided that black people would be considered two thirds of a man for the purposes of voting, so that the South didn't have too much voting power. And this is one of the many things that led to the Civil War. So post-Civil War, uh, the black man is set free, or so he thought. Um, and then uh, he's, he's set free to go on to get further abused by white people uh, with the entire civil rights movement. So he, he's now he's kind of free, but he's only kind of free to a limit. You know, he's having a hard time finding work. He's having a hard time finding schools to put his kids in, water fountains he can drink out of, buses he can fucking sit on. It's like... Everything, you know, it's like, it's everything comes in these like little steps, you know? Black man wants total freedom to become equal with white man. And the white man says, well, slow down, partner. Like, we're not really going to just let you up and become one of us tomorrow. And so it was kind of a, a phased rollout plan. It's kind of like an update on your phone, you know? Some people get the update before others, and there's varying degrees of, uh, uh, of new, new applications and, you know, whatever. So, now we flash forward to the 60s, and we've got Rosa Parks, and we've got uh, all of the movements, Martin Luther King Jr., all the movements that led toward um, black people finally getting some semblance of, of actual freedom. And that's where a lot of people think the story ends. But it doesn't. The story doesn't end here. Let me tell you why the story doesn't end here. Because the, the same white racist men who framed the Constitution and, and intentionally left black people and women out of it passed on their DNA to their sons. And their sons were more or less the same white racist misogynistic, chauvinistic men. 
And then that translates into the slave days, and then it translates into the civil rights days. By and large, white men have never really ever endeavored to give up their power. What they have done is tried to put lipstick on a pig since day one. We did the same thing with the American Indian, where we, we tried to kind of cover up our dirt, you know, we tried to soften the blow a little bit, yeah, you know, we did murder you guys almost into extinction, but you kind of had it coming, so how about we give you some land that we actually stole from you, and we'll let you raise salmon on it, and you can build casinos and grow tobacco, and we can't do that, we'll just give you those special rights, and That'll make it all better, right? White men are always like conniving some fucking crazy like seedy deals where they fucking talk real fast and make you a bunch of promises and things sound good because you're not thinking fast enough. You don't realize the insidiousness of the actual plan. And so, so you get the wool pulled over your eyes. And that all the way here in 2024 is still happening today. And you guys have been voting on it for fucking, I mean, almost a century now. So let me lay out what I'm talking about. Cause see, I grew up, my, my dad let me grow up, uh, we used to watch Def Comedy Jam when I was a kid. When I was in my, my late teens, you know, I got, I cut my teeth on Martin Lawrence and Chris Rock and, and all the original black stand-up comedians, Bernie Mac, you know, uh, D.L. Hughley. These guys, these guys formed they were like my connection to the black community because I didn't I didn't go to schools I wasn't surrounded by a lot of black people and so I didn't really have any connection to the, the to the black culture sometimes my dad didn't like me watching it because he used to always say ah you know I like Martin he's funny but he's so racist and they're all so racist they're racist <laughs> you know and uh, he didn't like the fact that they talk shit about white people and they talk shit about how abusive white people are to black people because that was that was formative for me as a young boy hearing a different side of the story. See, I was raised in a really racist family. My grandparents were were old school, you know, they were born in the 20s. You know, they said all the words you're not supposed to fucking say. I, I grew up hearing the N-word a lot. I grew up hearing a lot of crazy shit. And so I had to wade through you know, what I was being told at home and then what my experience was when I made friends with black people in school and a lot of the shit that I was being told at home didn't really add up, you know, or like when I'm sitting around watching Rock or, or Bernie Mac and I'm seeing the genius and the brilliance in these men and, 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 and hearing their experience and it forces you to view the world in a different way. Thankfully, it allowed me to see things from various angles because I was not I was not much exposed to it. So, but it also caused me to see things from every angle. I got to see things from the angle of uh, of the black man and the and the struggles that he was having in the world. But I also got to see things from the angle of the white man and his incessant need for power and domination and control. And what I figured out very young is these white guys, they're not giving up anything. I don't know what everybody thinks that they're, they're getting, but they're, they're not giving up anything. So let me give you some examples of how slavery still exists in America today and how you're probably voting for it. Let's, take, go, back, let's go back to the analogy of the slave quarters and the plantation. So the slaves... Or work in the fields for you know basically no wage. They they don't have but but they but they have a place to live. They have a roof over their heads. Now it's not a good place to live. It's very meager. It, it's it's certainly not the big house. It's certainly not anywhere anybody would aspire to live. And so, what white men did to keep to keep black men living in slave quarters is they created something called government housing. Section 8 housing. That's what they did. Because see, the, the objective of the white man has been since day one 
to try to cope with this little problem that he created when he brought all of these people over here and then decided he didn't like them very much. See, white people brought all the black people to America and then they just, and then they figured out, like, holy shit, these people's culture is not very similar to ours. They have they have very different attitudes about a lot of things. They seem to be disproportionately stronger than us. They seem to be disproportionately good at sports to us. That some of our women find them disproportionately attractive. These people are a threat, is what they figured out. What they figured out is that they brought, they voluntarily brought to America a group of people that was proving to be very threatening when left to their own fucking devices. And so the, the white man had to find a way to squelch this threat. And this is what has been happening since day fucking one in America. The white man has been squelching the threat pre presented by the black man. So the first thing that he did is he created government housing. And what government housing said was, if you don't make very much money, see, if you, if you can't afford to live in, a, in the big house, if you can't afford to get a nice big house of your own, then we will subsidize your housing. We will take tax dollars from those people who have money and we, we will use them to help you live either at a reduced rate or potentially for free in these housing projects. But the housing projects are terrible. They're horrible. You ever been to a fucking housing project? This is no place anybody wants to live. These are slave quarters is what they are. They're, they're really nothing more than modern day slave quarters and they're not designed, they're, they were never designed as a, stepping, as a stepping stone, they were designed as a stumbling block. See, it was never really set up for you to start out in the slave quarters and then work really hard at McDonald's or, or at the local, the local factory and save some money so that you could take the next step up and get your own apartment and get your own place. Because they set these special conditions in place where it makes it very hard for you to rise up. So the other thing that they did right about the same time, maybe at the very same time, is they created the food stamp program. And the food stamp program is the equivalent, is the modern day equivalent to the food that the slaves were being given to eat on the plantation. Not a lot, but it's enough to get you by. It's not a lot, it's just enough to get you by. So we're gonna feed you enough for free, and we're going to give you a, just enough room, just enough roof over your head for free, so that you can go out and do a bunch of jobs that nobody else wants to do. So you're effectively still working in the plantation. It's just not called the plantation anymore. It's called government housing and menial labor. So you're going to McDonald's back in the day when I was growing up, you know, you might be making $6 an hour flipping burgers and you're living in government subsidized housing and you're getting a fucking government welfare check every fucking month to help you out, to help you out with a little food. And maybe if you're struggling even more, they're picking up a little bit of your light bill. But see, all of this is determined by how much money you make. So take, for example, my ex-wife, who's not, who's not black. She got sucked into the same thing when she sent me to prison. When she sent me to prison, suddenly she was indigent. She had no job, and so she put her hand out, and the government put something in it. And what they put into her hand was free child care, free medical insurance, and free food. And they said, you can, you can have all of these things for free so long as you don't make more than, I think it was $13 an hour. You can't make more than that. When they say you can't make more than $13 an hour, what they're actually saying to you is you cannot leave the fields. You will pick cotton for the rest of your days. Now, it's not cotton anymore. It's just menial labor. It's just low-paying jobs that ensure that you are living in poverty. They want to keep you living in poverty because as long as you are as long as you're on the government tit, you are being controlled. They are controlling how much of a threat you can become 
to their organizations, their companies. They don't want you there. So they're going to keep you doing all of the jobs that they don't want for themselves and their sons and their daughters. And they're going to incentivize you to continue doing those jobs by making it easier for you to stay there by giving you these things for free. So my wife was working at this, ex-wife was working at this company for a little while and then she was doing good. She was succeeding. And so they came along and they said, hey, we're going to give you a raise to whatever it was. She was at $13 an hour. They were going to give her a raise like $16 an hour. And she freaked out. Instead of being excited and happy that she was getting a $2 an hour raise, a raise she freaked out. Because she did the math and she figured out, if I take this extra $2 an hour, I'm going to make X amount of dollars more per month. But I'm going to lose some or all of my benefits. And, the, and, I, and I'm not going to make enough money to replace those benefits. So I'm going to end up in the hole. If I take $16 an hour and then I have to pay for child care and medical care, well, then I'm actually going to bring home less money, and so I'm actually going to be losing. So the only way she could ever actually get out of the hole is she had to make a big leap. She had to somehow jump from $13 an hour up to like $20 plus dollars an hour just to try to break even. Because the higher the income, the more of the free handout she would lose. So when she calculated up that she was getting like $1,000, $1,100 a month for free food, Medical insurance would have cost her $600 a month. She was getting that for free, so that's $1,700. Child care was going to cost her, you know, six, dollars $700. She was getting two, $3,000 of, of, of goods and services from the American government. And then this little piss ant raise only was going to give her an extra like $500 a month. She's going to be $1,500 in the hole. And so she turned the raise down. She said, no, you cannot pay me more than $13 an hour because I'll lose all my benefits. Now, some of you may say that's a character flaw. Some of you may say, and I've said it in, my, in the past, I've said that you should have a mentality that says, no, I want to live on my own two feet. I don't want to be um, beholden to a government controls me. So I would, rather, I would rather lose a little of my benefits for a little while and make $16 an hour so that I can go earn 18 and then 20 and then I can get on my feet and I can climb the corporate ladder and one day maybe I can make $100,000, $200,000 a year like I did. See, some people have asked me, how did I go from homelessness to, to rich? I started out in a job that paid $2,000 a month. Now, I could have gone and got government handouts. I could have got Section 8 housing. I could have got free food stamps. But I didn't because I was proud. I was too proud to do it. So I was living next to people who were living easier than me off the government. But I chose differently. I chose to have less now so that I could have more later on down the road. So, when my net, so every time I got a job, uh, a, a pay increase, I was excited about it because my standard of living just went up. And so I grew a job that paid me $2,000 a month into a job that when I retired, I had just earned $160,000 that year. It was the same company that started me out at $2,000 a month. And all along, I had been saying these government handouts that are perpetuated by the liberal parties, the democratic parties, they're not designed to help anyone. They are designed to hurt you. Every time you use your food stamp card, you should hear them calling you boy, because that's what they're doing. Every time you take their free medical care, every time you, you go to sleep in government housing, you should hear the powers that run this country screaming the N-word or some other obscenity at you because that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. That's what these programs are designed to do. They are designed to keep you on the plantation. And they are still to this day in 2024 cracking the whips over the heads of so many people of every race. It, it's not just a black problem anymore. Poverty is not about the color of your skin. It's about the fact that the American government views you 
as they always did. Two-thirds of a person, that's what you are. You're two-thirds of a man because you're not smart enough or capable enough to go out, stand on your own two feet, and make your own way in this world. So we're going to help you and we're going to treat you like two-thirds of a man. Every time you go to a school district that has some type of DEI inclusion program going, you should hear the N-word rattling through those halls because that's what those programs are screaming at you. When you If you move to Oregon and you take their new GED test where they lowered all of the requirements because not enough people of color were passing the test, and so they said we need more people of color to pass the test, so instead of improving our education, what we're going to do is we're going to lower the testing requirements, you should hear whips cracking in the fucking air over your head while you're taking that test because that's what they are doing. They are treating you like two-thirds of a person. They're saying you're not as good as we are. You can't, you can't perform on our level. You can't do what we can do because you're two-thirds of a man. So we're going to let you have an easier way about it. We're going to make your test results, your tests easier to pass. We're going to give you free handouts because you can't do what we can do. When you get a job because of affirmative action, what you're being told is you're two-thirds of a fucking man or a woman. You couldn't get the job based on your qualifications alone. So we're going to grant it to you because you're not good enough. You're not, you're, you're not, you're not like us. We're going to grace you with a, with a position in our company so we can fill a quota so that we can say, hey, look, American voters, we hire more black, indigenous people of color than any other country, any other company in our sector so that they can, they can con you into voting for the policies that are holding you down. Every single time you vote Democrat, in this country, you're voting for a slave owner. You're voting for the very same people who were cracking the whips over the backs of your ancestors in Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and Candyland. All the people who you claim to hate, that you claim to want reparations from, those people were Southern Democrats. That's right. The KKK was a group of Southern Democrats. And you people are letting them get away with it. They enslaved you in the South, and then they moved North, and they changed the name of the game. They closed down all the plantations. They closed down all the slave quarters. They gave you your seat on the bus. And then, but they kept believing the same thing they believed about you when they founded this nation. And what they believed about you when they founded this nation was that you're not equal. You're not like us. You're two-thirds of a fucking man. And we're going to keep treating you like that for the rest of, the nat of your natural lives. And not only are you not going to throw a fit about it, you are going to celebrate it. That's what they did to you. They convinced you that all of those handouts were for your own good. Don't you realize this government doesn't give anything away? Nothing. Everything you get from the government is costing somebody somewhere. And they lied and they told you, well, all these rich white people that you hate, they're going to pay so you can have free things. No, they're not. Rich white people never pay for shit. Every time they raise taxes on rich, rich white people, you know who pays for it? People in poverty. Every time they raise the minimum wage, haven't you noticed? Cost of a hamburger goes up to the same price. Every time they ra raise the minimum wage, cost of milk goes up. Cost of your cheap apartment goes up. You will always be paying for this. The rich white man never pays for it because he knows all the shell games to play. Remember that? The shell game? That's what they're doing to you right now with all this legislation. Follow the shell. Watch where it goes. Follow the racism. Watch where it goes. You can't keep up with this shell game because they're too busy. They're too busy swindling you with government handouts, Obamacare, Section 8 housing, uh, diversity, inclusivity, equality, 
uh, uh, fucking uh, affirmative action, lower testing scores. They keep telling you that they are doing the right thing by you and all they are really doing is locking you back in those slave quarters and cracking the fucking whips over your head. So if you really want to be free, if you really want to see an end of racism and slavery in America, vote for Donald Trump. That's right. Vote for all of those people who keep taking your incentives away from you. All of the people who keep taking the benefits away, who keep wanting to shorten the term that you can spend on welfare, who want to increase the regulations and the requirements, who want to drug test. All of these people who are trying to take the incentives away from you, what they are trying to do is take you out of the slave quarters and incentivize you to own the big house. That's what the Republican Party is all about. They're the least racist party of all. They are the party that wants everybody to succeed because they understand in what a commercial, uh, a capitalist society does. If we can get people out of poverty, off the government tip, and get them working high paying jobs for good wages and living in mansions and buying Bentleys and BMWs and Mercedes Benz and putting premium gas in their cars and putting Louis Vuitton on the, on the, on the backs of their kids, fuck, on their, on their kids' backs on the way to school. This is what drives an economy. Right now we have a sinkhole because the, the cruel, evil men, some of which who founded this nation, want to keep the fucking lesser, they, they want to keep some of us down. And that is all these programs are. So understand this. The next time you go into a voting booth to decide who are you going to pick, you are actually deciding whether or not you are pro or against Racism, slavery, bigotry, chauvinism, these are the things that are on every ticket in every fucking voting booth across America. And if those are the things that you disagree with, then check the name that has R next to it on the fucking, on the, on the ballot. Because those are the only people who have any interest in setting this shit right. The liberal agenda in this country is built on absolutely destroying this world that we live in by giving everything away. They want to create some insane socialist fucking disgusting environment that has failed every single time it's ever been attempted. They are looking to destroy this nation and they will set it back to anarchy. And I'm telling you right now, you don't want that because there's guys like me walking around the world. You should look at my other video about alphas and shit. You don't want anarchy in this world. That is the last thing you want. These people seem to not be scared of it and that is what we will get if the fucking Democrats succeed in destroying this nation. So there you have it. I hope you can hear past your cognitive dissonance and your hate and understand that there is a pathway to success in this situation and it is, it is, it is biting the hand that pretends to feed you. The hand that pretends to feed you is poisoning you with every dollar they gift you. Turn away from those fucking gifts and, t and temptations. Let's put Donald Trump in office and let's make America, make America great again. As always, thank you for watching. We'll see you next. See you in the next one.